fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren. Mr. Michael Butterfield is here. Hi, Al. Hey, so how's how's the old Zodiac thing going? Uh, well, unfortunately, no new news. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I hate to say that, but yeah, it's... Uh, well, I didn't really... three years and going, yeah. It's time for a revival, right? Another whole book series to come out. Oh, don't worry. There's plenty of, there's probably somebody out there writing a book about Kermit the Frog being the Zodiac. So <laughs> that'll, that'll be on shelves soon. I'm sure he probably is. <laughs> or, you know, it's, it's Sesame Street. Yeah. Good cover. Yeah. Anyway, well, today we're going to jump right into it because we've got a great guest here. We've got oh, yeah. uh, um, quite the author. So, Mr. Joe Lansdale, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Joe, you've done a lot. And, uh, um, <laughs> I don't know where to begin because it's an you, understatement. Yeah. yeah, I just like, wow. Um, so let's let's kind of go where it started for you. How did you decide to get into this kind of a business, or what led you into writing? Ah, well, the insanity for one. You know, you uh, and I, <laughs> I, I was growing up in uh, East Texas, Gladewater, you know, area. That I was born in Gladewater and lived in the East Texas area all my life. I didn't know any other writers. I didn't know anybody that wanted to write. I didn't know anything about editors or publishers. My father could not read or write. My mother had 11th grade education, which back then was equal to a, you know, a senior education. And she was a big reader. So she was a big influence in that area. But when I was about four, I, I wanted to write comics. I mean, I was reading when I was four because I started so early and my mother, you know, uh, helped me learn to read and, I would memorize the comics they would read to me, and then gradually I just, you know, kept picking it up. So by the time I was four, I was trying to write and draw comics, and uh, I was a terrible comic artist, but I was pretty good at the stories. And over the years, I just kept, you know, cranking at it until I was uh, 21 and sold an, uh, an article with my mother under her name, and then I began to sell other articles, and then eventually I moved towards my real love, which was uh, fiction, telling stories, and uh, so I, I guess you could say since I was four, I've been working at it, been doing it all my life. And I've been published since I was 21 and full time since I was 29. That's a nutshell. <laughs> Did you expect this kind of um, these kind of results? How's that? Um, I expected to be able to do it. I expected to be able to make a living at it. But I I think that I have had far more phenomenal success than I ever expected. And in more than just one uh aspect of of writing you know so I, I can't say i expected that i don't know exactly what i expected but my you know my wife and i are we we're happy every day with the uh success that that we've had you know and uh we both worked all kinds of jobs and you know i my last job was as a janitor and before that i, I worked in the rose fields i was a bouncer i worked on a lunar chair factory before i met my wife um you know tons of things like that along so there was nothing to indicate that I was going to have the kind of success I've had, you know, and and uh, doing it my way and doing it my way has probably kept me from having uh, the same kind of financial success or uh, the uh, broader success that some have had. But it was exactly what I wanted. And I'm one of the few people I know that can honestly say I got what I wanted out of life. You know, I, I read a quote where you said something like, when you first started out, you thought you were going to write serious stories. Mm. And then at a certain point, you realized that genre fiction was for you. What 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 kind of serious stories did you originally well, think about writing? I always loved genre fiction. It was never that I, I, I didn't want to write genre fiction. But I, I think, too, uh, I always thought that I wanted to write. Uh, a, you know, a novel that was serious about my, my time and generation and all that sort of stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. 
Then one day when I was, I had already, you know, sold some things, I was writing a, a, a novel called Savage Season, and I realized, you know what, this is my 60s novel. This is it. And even though it took place in the 80s, it was looking back at a time, and by doing it as a genre novel, I realized that I could suddenly uh, do anything I wanted. I could have the, the, the pulp influences, the paperback influences, but I could also have the literary influences, and I realized that trying to be a literary writer wouldn't wouldn't satisfy me. I mean, making that effort so I would be recognized as a literary writer. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to tell stories above all. And then secondly, I wanted to have something to say, but not with everything. I didn't want to be tied to having to be pulp or literature or what have you. But I also felt that in some novels I was able to do a lot more because they were genre and people were more willing to read them because the the vehicle was more interesting and more exciting and uh, had the better line, so to speak. And uh, so by doing it that way, I was able to do both. And uh, I've also written stories that, you know, cross genres and mix literature and and pulp and all that. And it's whether, you know, you're a literary writer or a genre writer, ultimately you, other people will tell you that. You may be working in those fields and have certain intent, but time and readers, they, they, get, they reveal who you are and what you're doing. Well, you certainly crossed a lot of genre lines with horror and Western and science fiction. I have, no doubt about it. I've, I've, uh, I've written for literary magazines. I've written for some of the what was almost like the last of the pulps as a digest size magazine. But Mike Shane Mystery Magazine. I wrote for sort of uh, upper scale things like Twilight Zone magazine when it first came out. I wrote for anthologies, primarily short stories early in my career, and then I moved to novels. And uh, I wrote novels like Jane Goes North and Fender Lizards, which are not strictly speaking genre novels. And all the earth thrown to the sky. They published as, uh, um, well, two of them were published as young adult novels, I guess. But uh, I, I just felt like that I just didn't want to be tied to that. I did some children's books. I did one with my um, uh, son and wife, and I did one on my own. I would like to do others, but, you know, if time's a, a restriction as I grow older, I, I have to really say, well, what, what is it that I'm going to do today? And I realized that I've always pretty much just done what I wanted to do, with some exceptions. You know, I'm a I'm a full time freelance writer, and I make a living at this. You know, you you know, if you want to have your electricity on and your bills paid, you you tend to get regular exercise. And uh, but for the most part, I've been able to look at things and say, look, I what can I find in this that's exciting and interesting? And generally, I've always been able to find that. And mostly, I've been able just to proceed with my own interests, just, you know, follow that path. It certainly worked. It, it worked for me. I can't tell you exactly why. You know, I don't know. I, I like to think I have a voice that that has some impact and is memorable. But some of it, you know, is kind of the turn of the roulette wheel to some extent. You know, you, you've got to be known in the right places to be known at all, you, meaning that the right people have to pick you up at the right time. Maybe you get the right word of mouth, because word of mouth built my career more than anything. Reviews were good, but word of mouth has been the thing that's carried me long, along longer. And it, it got me into film. It got me into comics. It you know, got me into all kinds of nonfiction and uh, even poetry and, and stage plays. I mean, all of that comes out of my love for these things, but it also comes out of, you know, having a break here and there that led to a lot of other breaks. And success breeds success. And that's the truth. Well, I was mentioning to Al before we went on the air that I read a quote from another writer, which referred to you as the most well-known unknown writer. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's fair enough. It's it's probably a little less accurate now. I've become better known. Yeah. Yeah. That Um, quote, but I do think that was fairly accurate. My daughter actually said that in a, um, uh, a documentary that Hansi Oppenheimer did on me called All Held the Popcorn King. And, oh, yeah. uh, and I, I think that that, that and, and she may have been quoting someone, but I remember her saying that. And I've, I've heard two or three people say that over the years. And I think that there's a certain accuracy about that. And like I said, maybe less so in the last 10 years. But uh, I think that was it. I mean, people have been reading and seeing my stuff for years and not really realizing or putting it together that, I was the guy doing all of that or that 
they might know I wrote one sort of thing, but not know I wrote the other sort of thing. And I think that there was a culmination of that as, you know, Bubba Hotep, a film based on my work, helped. But I think oh, yeah. Cold in July helped, which is another film. But I really believe the TV series gave a lot of recognition to the Happen Leonard uh, stories. And then that led to a greater recognition of my work in, in general. And maybe Love, Death, and Robots recently. I think that's even you know, bumped it a little. And so, you know, there's, there's all of these things and one is piled on top of the other. And I think I've been fortunate instead of having like a big moment with us, you know, a lightning strike and everything, you know, goes my way. I've sort of built my career brick by brick. And I'm proud of it. When you, when you have that kind of success or you're doing well, um, do you have a, a problem trying to keep it fresh or how do you, keep kind of going well i think the main thing i do is i try to just keep myself interested you know the longer you're mm -hmm. around the more you realize that you are going to repeat certain themes and certain ideas because those are the things that intrigue you the thing is is that if i feel it's too familiar i try not to, to do it or I, I try not to move away from it but on the other hand a certain amount of familiarity is acceptable like in a series like Happ and leonard if you get too far afield of them then they aren't Happ and leonard but yet you've got the problem of having to bring these characters back, which are now familiar to a certain audience, and try to keep them fresh. So I just the only way I know how to do that is I just try to be excited about the work and find humor in things and find, uh, you know, um, all of those things that I grew up with that have stayed with me. They're the real source of almost all of my work. You know, after a certain point, I think, you know, you still you have new you, you learn new things, you have new experiences, but I believe those earlier experiences, and, and even if they don't always shape exactly what you're talking about, they shape the way you talk about it. So I find that if I can try to get in touch with my subconscious, that I'm happy. And I know full scale that sometimes when I'm writing something, I'm building a chair, where at other times I might be trying to build a cathedral. Now, whether I did that or not, either case is up to the reader to decide, but I'm going to try to build the damnedest best chair I can, as well as the best cathedral I know how to build, meaning that not everything, I don't ever compete with myself. I don't ever think, oh, this has got to be better than the last. I just say it's time for the new thing. Do your best. So Born for Trouble is the, is the newest book in the Happ and Leonard, Leonard series. Mm -hmm. just, those two characters, how do, you, how do you create characters like that, and how do you make them so real? Uh, like, because you're obviously not these characters. <laughs> well, um, so, yeah, but, but to some extent I am, you know, and I, I think, yeah. first of all, I grew up in East Texas, like Hap and Leonard. I worked in the rose fields like Hap and Leonard. I had most of the jobs they had. I grew up in a tough environment, although not my own personal, you know, my parents were great, you know, um, but, but there was a, it was a tough world in, in East Texas in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, things were moved, moving a lot slower there than they did in some other locations. In other words, it was probably the 1930s and 40s for 30 years. <laughs> you know, you had new cars and, and new things, but, you know, things reached uh, East Texas much more slowly. And when the Internet came along, things like that boosted how fast people knew this or knew that. But um, I actually, you know, would not obviously I'm not half and Leonard. I'm not, you know, having all these incredible adventures and I'm not doing these things that I think are actually criminal that they do. But <laughs> I, I do yeah. I, I do believe that most of what they are is who I am, you know, at least in the base of that, in the center of that. And uh I think that's what makes it easier for me to write about them. I and Leonard is based on people I knew and me. And a hap is based on me and some people I knew, you know, and that's what a writer does. You're kind of a magpie. You pick a little something here, you pick a little something there, and you bring it all back to your nest. And uh, so that's the best I can answer that. I, I, you know, some some things I think that as a writer, you can express why or this or that. But some things are beyond the understanding because you you don't know what's in your head and all those things and how they, uh, you know, blended in the way that they have i mean i'm not saying supernatural or anything i'm just talking about you know from the standpoint of what we think and how our experiences shape us i don't know that we always know the exact truth um you know i can think of a few epiphanies in my life here and there 
But for the most part, I think that, you know, we trudge along and hopefully learn from our past or from our experiences, which overall in humanity doesn't really seem to be the case. We don't necessarily learn from those bad experiences and try to do things better. We keep repeating the same things over and over. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know that that's even a definitive answer, but I, I do think that it has a lot to do with my environment. It has a lot to do with, uh, to some extent, with genetics. So I think environment can certainly trump genetics to a great extent in, in many cases. I think it has to do with my own, you know, life experiences, which again is just an extension of the idea of environment. Um, and it also has to do with other people I've observed and listened to. And it has to do with the fact that I'm a, a a voracious reader and always have been. So I've accumulated those experiences, but I'm, I don't just have the stink of the library on my work because I've lived life. You know, I haven't sailed around the world on a log or climbed, you know, Everest in skis or anything, but I have, you know, I, I've, I've lived a real life. And uh, I think that that makes it different than sitting down and just writing about characters you made up entirely. I, I borrowed from many, many things to stitch them together. We interview a lot of writers for different things, and, and quite a few fic fiction writers um, will say they experience their characters like either like a movie or hear voices in their head, and, and I hear all these different things. What's your personal experience with your characters? Oh. You know, I, I'm a big believer in writing from the subconscious and not the conscious mind. The conscious kind of cleans things up, but the subconscious knows things you don't know. And I don't plot. I never sit down and plot because that makes the characters unreal to me. But my subconscious must, you know, it must be putting these things together so that when I sit down, it goes, OK, here it is. And it just starts unraveling. And and it is very cinematic for me. I, and I think it's because I'm not only influenced by a tremendous amount of reading. I'm influenced by cinema. I'm a big fan of films and I've written for written scripts and things like that. And I love comic books. I love their imagery. I love painting and painters. And all of those things have somehow blended together to, to create uh, how I see these characters. And then I borrow from the way I hear people talk. Uh, of course, I, I try to give the illusion of how people talk more than trying to give exactly how people talk, because it makes it more interesting when the characters have something that's intriguing to say instead of the guy going, damn, I wish I'd have said that smart line that I didn't say, you know, and things like that. But to me, it's just a, it's still it goes back to the same thing. It's an accumulation of all that. And it is very cinematic. Well, I was going to say a friend of mine is a huge fan of your work. Um he seems like every other week he's all excited because he just ordered one of your books for his <laughs> That's collection. Right. That's wonderful. And uh, if you don't mind, <clears throat> he gave me a few questions to ask. Sure. You. sure um, go ahead. The first is, uh, will we ever see a Jim Bob Luke novel? Now, Jim Bob Luke first appeared in your novel, Cold in July, right. and later appeared in some of the Happen Leonard books. Also, correct. Have you ever thought about giving him his own story i have the problem i've had with jim bob is he's so confident and he's so um egotistical about about his abilities it could make for a funny book but it also makes it hard for you to write um as objectively as you would like uh i mean i think i would you know if you did it you do it in first person is the, is the, my favorite way of writing but i might have to step back and do it in third but then again i, I think that that might not work either. It may be like eating too much chocolate. <laughs> he may be a better, uh, he better be a, an occasional character or a, um, you know, a character actor than be the star. So I don't know if I ever will or not, but yes, I have thought. Do you have any other favorite recurring characters who might be worthy of their own stories? Vanilla Ride. I think there's a chance that I will write um, a story or a book about Vanilla Ride. And she appeared in first in the novel called Vanilla Ride, which was a Half and Leonard novel. And she appeared in uh, uh, Devil Red and Honky Tonk Samurai. And I don't think anything else other than those three. But she certainly had an impact, you know. And, and it's funny because when I wrote those three novels, especially the first two, I almost felt like that I had kind of lost that more down to earth feel for the half and winter novels. And it was kind of a broader uh, approach, but 
I also, when I reread them years later, I thought, no, it still happened, Leonard, but it is also a broader approach. And it, it was fun. It kept the characters from getting stale. And then when I went back to them in Rusty Puppy, Jack Rabbit Smile, it was much more like the original Happen Leonard books. But I think I was always consistent with who they were and how they acted. And uh, so I, I'm really pleased with the 12 novels I've written, the four collections of stories and novellas. Uh, I've had great fun with them, but I do believe that Vanilla Ride in, you know, has uh, the potential to making being a really good breakout character. And so I, I have thought about it. Uh, for, forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but didn't Don Johnson play Jim Bob Luke? Yes, in, he did. Uh, Cold yes, in he July? Did. Yeah, he was very good. And then you had the hap. That's what I was going to say. And then you had the Happen Leonard series for right. um, Sundance, I believe. Right. Does Three seeing years. the characters Three portrayed by actors ever influence what you think? Do they ever bring something to the character that you didn't think of or that you incorporate into your writing? They, they sometimes bring something to the character I didn't think of, and then they bring it brilliantly. But I, I'm not much influenced by that because the characters are already mine and I already visualize yeah. who they are. And it's it would be hard for me to start saying, well, they're this or that. But I, mm-hmm. I, I see the, the Happen Learn series as an alternate universe version of my um, series, and I think it's just great. Pure Foy really did a great job of producing the, you know, the way I would feel Hap thinks, and, and uh, he, he, he got that underlying actual kindness that Hap has and his sort of feeling that, you know, I'm, I'm making a lot of mistakes. And then I thought that uh, Michael K. Williams uh, really brought uh, Leonard to life, although he was much smaller than I didn't consider Leonard a giant, but I thought he'd be a, a, a bigger, more muscular kind of guy. And uh, so I, I didn't visually at first think of him, but once he became that character on screen, he was that character. But in my head, they're still my characters that I create. Well, I think that there's a, I don't know if this is the correct word, but there's a certain zaniness to your writing. And yeah. how important is when you have those adapted by people? Like I thought Don Coscarelli was a great choice yeah. to adapt yeah. your work. Right. Well, uh, actually, you know, Don wasn't a choice. He 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 sort of took it. He, he was a guy that wanted yeah. to do it and he optioned it. So nobody chose him in a... Because he was uh, mm-hmm. he was the producer and or at least a producer, uh, he directed it. He wrote the script. Uh, you know, he he did everything but act act in it. And if he'd had time, he might have played all the parts. He's just that kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> but he was perfect. He did a wonderful job. He did incident on and off a mountain road for uh, Showtime as well, uh, based on my yeah. story. Yeah. And he did a good job of that too. And uh, Bruce Campbell and Ossie Davis, you couldn't ask for a better pair, a better cast. And, okay, uh, yeah. you know, that's that's how I became friends with Don and and Ossie. I knew Don before that. We'd already become friends. He came and stayed at the house for a while trying to convince me uh, to let him have the rights to certain things. And some of them were already acquired. But he later uh, acquired um, Bubba and on, uh, on, uh, on and off a of mountain road and optioned those. But, um, you know, it, it 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 made a kind of bond, I think, between us, you know, uh, uh, because it, when you're working low budget, I think there's a, a different feel to it. And, and Don would mm-hmm. not like for us to call it a B movie. And I, I get yeah. what he means by that, but I'm, I'm sort of, I think Bruce agrees with me. It's a B movie in the best sense of the word. You know, it doesn't have yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. It's not trying to, you know, startle you and dazzle you with special effects. It's just damn good acting. Uh, and it has a thematic depth that goes beyond the sort of metaphorical uh, setup. And now I was going to ask you, for those of us who are looking to read a collection of your short stories, which of yours would you recommend? Do you have a favorite? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, a lot of them are coming back into print now. So uh, there's, if, you, if you're going to read on a Kindle, you can go online at from Subterranean Press, and they have republished um, in ebooks the books that were published by SST that are four volumes and they don't cover all my work and they're not each story the best, but there's some of the best amongst them. And there's some that are, I think are outstanding or good or quirky enough to, to include. And there's four volumes. There's cosmic interruptions, which deals kind of with the science fictional stuff. These are arbitrary, especially in my case, as far as titles and, and things, but cosmic interruptions. And then, uh, 
uh, blood in the gears, which is, leans more towards crime, and wet juju, which leans more towards uh, horrific or strange, and then gothic wounds, which deals with kind of gothic stories, but it also cheats and deals with westerns and historical stuff and some uh, very curious odds and ends. So if you could go online for those four books, you've got, and they're huge books, so you've got a lot of reading there. And it would give you kind of an overall view of my career. And if you were looking for a best of volume, which I think it is a little outdated, but it's still good and it's available from Tachyon Books, is the best of Joe R. Lansdale. So those would be the ones I would recommend off the top of my head. Uh, many of them are going to be rearranged and reprinted in the near future. Because I had people say, well, you know, I have that book. Why do you keep, you know, redoing them? I say, because you have that book and that book's out of print and there are new readers. I'm, I'm fortunate that I get new readers all the time and I want them to have those stories that may be no longer available. Now, is it true that your personal favorite of your novels is Paradise Sky? It is true. Yes. What draws you to the Western genre? Hmm. Well, I like all of the genres, and sometimes when I'm working on one genre, I'm, I'm anxious to get to another. You know, maybe that's because you, you have maybe you have hard days or something. But I love all of it. But you know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a big fan of westerns, and like I said, he he couldn't read or write. Towards the end of his life, he got to where he could kind of dope out the newspaper and comic books, and and he tried to read books. He tried hard. He would spend months reading one paperback, but it was always a western paperback. And I'm sure he didn't get the totality of it, you know, but uh, I, to, but to wait till you're 50 something, start learning to read is, uh, you know, quite a thing. And then he never really did learn to read and he never learned to write anything but his name. Uh, but he liked Western movies and Western TV series. And so I grew up in the era when those were hot. And so he and I would watch those. And I think that uh, my early reads of Westerns weren't, didn't impress me much because I, they, I didn't much care for them. I didn't think the ones I read were very good. And then later on in life, and when I was in my 20s, in, in the 1970s, I began to read more Westerns and thought, wow, I just read the wrong ones. And so as I began to read more Westerns, I found that there was something deep inside of me that was moved by them. And I think part of that was the fact that my father was born in 1909. He was 42 when I was born. My mother was born in 1914. So when my dad was born, you know, um, Buffalo Bill was still alive. Annie Oakley was still alive. Uh, White Earp was still alive. Bat Masterson was still alive. And some of them died when he was a teenager, you know. And it's just uh, amazing to think about. And his his past coming from poverty coming from absolutely no education, going to work at eight years old. Um, he was not that far from the Old West. And he told stories that had been passed down to him, as well as stories of his own, because the West didn't just say, it's 1900, I quit. You know, the elements of that continued on into the early 1900s. And uh, in fact, World War I is, is sometimes called the Cowboy War um, because of the use of horses. And of course, Pancho Villa was pursued uh, across the uh, Texas state line into Mexico by, you know, har horse-drawn uh, cavalry. I mean, who, I mean horse-drawn artillery and cavalry and things of that nature. Those, you know, those things were still going on. So I think that that may have impacted on me, as did the Great Depression, which my parents went through as, you know, young adults or um, certainly young men and women. And they had a lot of stories about that because, you know, my dad worked all kinds of horrid jobs to to survive and, and as well as my mother. And so they came out of that, I, I think, scarred by it to some degree, but also feeling like champions because they had survived it. And though, though we never had a lot of money, I think they thought we were living a, a damn good life. I, I know I did. I didn't think anything about it because so many people around me were the same. But compared to what they had been through, they thought that. And I think that that the thirties, as well as the old West stories and things impacted me so that um, the Western and uh, sort of things in the, in the thirties and stuff seemed to have had a, a, a great, a, you know, influence on the sort of things I write. Well, I was also going to ask you if you have any more projects lined up with your kids. Ah, uh, yes. 
Um, my daughter and I, of course, we had a book of short stories come out, but it's being done in a special edition from um, SST Press, a small, you know, a small run, but a special, really cool looking edition of Terra is Our Business. Uh, Casey and I also have a collection of short stories that we've written together unrelated to those characters uh, called um, uh, Dark Kin, which comes out from Thunderstorm Books. She and I have a comic book series coming out from Dead Sky. We turned in the first issue and we've written some independent short stories since then. Uh, my son and I have worked together on, we had a novel that we did together and uh, he wrote a screenplay based on one of my novels that, I mean, one of my stories that I hope to direct as a film, if all things continue in, in that direction. And uh, we have other things planned together. So yeah, I, I think there will be more, you know, Depends on how long I live. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done a lot of work in comic books, uh, especially yes. if I remember correctly for Jonah Hex and things like that. Yeah. How do you feel about the way that comic books have kind of taken over uh, film and, and television these days? Well, I think film took over comic books. So I, I think, I think <laughs> yeah, that's comic, probably right. comic books don't sell that well anymore. And uh, the characters mm -hmm. from the comics, what, what happened is that, one of the things when we were kids, if we read superhero comics like Batman or Iron Man or whatever, because I had all of those things. I read all the original Marvel. I used to have them all. The old story about, you know, your mom throws away your comics. But um, <laughs> I think the difference is, is that in more recent years, that the stuff that you couldn't do on film, you'd see a film and it always like, yeah, Batman, yeah, yeah, that doesn't look right. And then all of a sudden yeah. now they have special effects that, rival what a, what an artist can do what a comics can do because it's just another form of art and yet it mm -hmm. moves and it's impressive and it's uh it feels a, a a giant screen and i so i think a lot of the things that made superhero comics unique are no longer unique to comics anymore but i think the popularity of those kinds of stories uh you know are obviously continuing just in a, a different way now this might come out of left field here but i read this about you and i just had to ask yep. you were chosen to finish a tarzan story after right. edgar rice burroughs died That's um right. what is that like for someone being known for your own style how do you bring <laughs> that to writing another a character from another writer well i'm a, a a great fan of edgar rice burroughs i you know i think a lot of his stuff is dated and and such but he was the first writer that not the first writer that kind of made me want to write, but he was the first writer that, that was such that impacted me in such a way I knew I had to write. And he was such a great storyteller. So I was well versed in everything that he had written. You know, I'd read up the Tarzan, the John Carter, Mars, the Pellucidor, um, you know, all of the other individual books that he had written that were available, you know, to us in paperback. And, uh, and once I found one, I started searching for all of them. And, so I was on the phone with, uh, I think it was Jerry Prosser, who at that time worked at Dark Horse. And, and it may have been someone else, you know, I, I, I don't remember exactly. And they were, we were talking about some other project that I was doing there or was being done uh, for my stuff. And uh, whoever this editor was mentioned that they had the rights to Tarzan, to the Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan. And I said, man, that's fantastic. And he said, yeah, and we have this unfinished Tarzan novel that, uh, you know, we, we're going to hire somebody to finish. And I said, oh, man, you need to get Philip Jose Farmer. You know, he's one of my favorite writers. I really like him. And he would just do you a tremendous job. And they said, uh, well, we were thinking of you. And I said, well, what the hell with Philip Jose Farmer? Yeah, <laughs> I'll do it. So I had a real short deadline, and I, I didn't try to, like, copy his style verbatim because I had a, a kind of my own style, but I tried to find a place where I didn't jettison his style. And I had 80 pages of his work, which I moved around. And, you know, some of it, it had dated attitudes about race and women and things that were yeah. not just a little off, but were extremely off. And I sort of felt like I knew why this one had never been published and it was in uh, a safe. It wasn't his best work. And I think he recognized that and put it away. But I think it turned out to be a, a good novel when I sort of moved some things around and and made some of the um, 
things a little bit more, you know, I didn't do it political, cor- politically correct because I, I, I don't like that extreme political correctness. But, you know, this was so much of a time when uh, black people were looked upon as, you know, lesser human beings. And, 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 and actually Burroughs could be very inconsistent about that. Sometimes he would have a different viewpoint there, but it wasn't just the character's viewpoint. It came across as the novel writer's viewpoint. And so some of that stuff I updated, but for the most part, um, I kept it pretty much what he was doing and just finished it out. And it was a great, great pleasure to have done. And then later on, I was hired to do a a Tarzan novella and a John Carter short story. And I greatly enjoyed those. And it's possible that I may, in fact, do more work in that arena, you know, because those were the things that first impressed me as a as a child. And so I, I, it's sort of a respectful thing, but it's also nice to slip into that particular uh, kind of story, which I don't think is particularly that popular anymore because it's been mutated, borrowed, and and worked on so oh, yeah. so many times. But that doesn't keep me from being interested in it. Now, those were culminated in, I think it was a four-volume set called Tarzan, The Lost Adventure. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they were... They were individual. There were four individual kind of pulp style comics, and then they were put into a novel. And uh, that came out in hardback and then paperback. And I think in they're they're redoing, I think, all of the Tarzan books in uh, um, special editions and things. And, and of course, that one will eventually get there. I hope I hope while I'm still around, you know. Because uh, there are a lot of Tarzan books. You go like 20-something years, <laughs> 30 years, yeah, you're still yeah. doing Tarzan. I'm wondering, so what? what is the um... – a day in the life of uh, Joe Lansdale. Uh, how do you how do you plan your your writing time? And can you just actually plan it, sit down, outline, and do it? Or do I don't you have to particular? I don't mode? outline it. You don't outline. I don't outline. No. What what I do is that I work every morning. You know, I very rarely take off um, because since I'm not going to work by more than three hours a day, what's to take off from? You know, every now and again, I will take a day off or feel like I need to get away from a project. But there's a difference in goofing off and taking off. And so I try never to goof off. Uh, I, I say, well, I get up in the morning and I go in, I have my coffee, my piece of toast. I go up to the computer. I turn it on. I hit the highlights on the email, uh, the fan page, and then I jump right into it. And because I don't want to wake up too much because I want to be somewhat in that semi dream state. And I start writing and I go three to five pages is my limit of, uh, I mean, my bottom. And if I get more than that, and sometimes I do, sometimes I'll get 10 or 15 pages, but it all sort of comes together within about three hours. And and I couldn't tell you why that is. And sometimes I'll get three pages and think, I don't want to do any more today on this. And I'll switch over to a short story and work on it or some other project. But because I show up, almost every day, including holidays, because I'm not really affecting holidays since I work early. And since I'm done before anybody's deciding to do Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever it is, um, it makes me seem far more prolific than I am. I'm a steady writer uh, and I write reasonably fast, but the real key to my uh, being prolific really has to do with just showing up. I don't believe in the muse. I don't wait for the muse to show up because I am the muse. I'm writing this stuff. You know, and when my when I get up in the morning, nine times out of 10, by the time my feet hit the floor, I'm already ready. Uh, You know, I haven't thought about it in any big conscious way. And uh, I just let the subconscious tell me the story. So I'll be surprised if I outline something, I lose interest in it. I don't really want to do it. And I'm not saying that's a bad way of doing it for other people. There's no set way of doing it. It's what works for you. But outlining definitely doesn't work for me. Well, I saw some great advice you had given writers when you said just get your butt in a chair and write. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that when you're writing, you got to write like everybody you know is dead. You can't be writing. That was a great one. Friends or people and things like that. Now, when you get done, you can hope like hell other people like it. But I think when you're writing it, if you're, you're sitting there and you're constantly conscious of other people's viewpoints or, or how they'll receive this agents, editors, friends, you know, family, whatever. I think you're, you're screwed because it's already getting away from you. It's starting to be somebody else's story, whether you know it or not. But if you write your story, when you get done and you had a good time doing it, usually you'll find that there are people who respond to the same things that you respond to. 
And it causes you, for me anyway, it often causes me to make choices that are totally outside the box. And, and sometimes I, I, you know, I feel like I want to do something that's somewhat traditional in feel. And I try to do that as well as I can, but I also try to make it have its own approach to that tradition and to sort of create another layer on top of it or under it. Uh, so to me, it's, it's a joy to be a writer. I'm not one of those that loves having written. I like writing and then having written as well. So it does, does mood or things going on around you affect how the outcome is? You know, like look at the last couple of years, all the craziness and the pandemic and all the, you know, political fighting and stuff. Does, yeah. does kind of mood or the tension around you kind of seep into the writing or maybe yeah. affect it? Yeah, I think it does. I think I think that even subconsciously it does. You know, you... Um, I don't think it affects the quality of my work, but it sometimes affects the content. And uh, so in that way, things going on around me or things that I'm interested in or things that I'm seeing or hearing may find their way directly into the work, but more often they find their way metaphorically into the work because I'm not always conscious that I'm doing it. Well, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you get up and check your uh, fan mail and things like that. You obviously yeah. had said that your career has been built a lot on word of mouth. Right. How important is it nowadays with Facebook and social media and everything to connect with your fans? Because I've heard that you're very appreciative. and uh, I am very appreciative of, of my readers. You know, I, I tend to think of them more as readers than, than fans, but I um I'm very appreciated of it, appreciative of it, but at the same time, I wish I didn't have Facebook or Twitter or any of that stuff because uh, I think <laughs> that there's so much other stuff that it goes with it, you know. But I don't spend a lot of time on it. I'm I I'm sort of I hit I hit it through the day on Twitter, for example. I'll I'll hit through the day, but by the time of the end of the day, I probably spent 20 minutes, and I, yeah. I respond quickly. I'm not, you know, I don't I don't have a like a long time between putting something together because I know that this is my time just to be loose, not to try to be, uh, you know, trying to uh, produce literature on Twitter, you know? And so uh, for me, I, I enjoy the contact with uh, readers and, uh, but you know, people make the mistake of thinking that Twitter is the universe and it's not, you know, uh, yeah. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not like a super politically correct guy, but I, I, I you know, politically I lean left and uh, that's I, I always have. But I'm not a far left or far right because I think they're the same people, they're the same jackasses. So if I get that on my Twitter or whatever, I, that stuff, I just go gone, you know, or or I, I sometimes I'll respond if they're reasonable and what they're trying to say. But if it's just, you know, some hysterical uh, uh, approach to their viewpoint, then I just get rid of them. But on Twitter, it, it's kind of gotten down to where it's book people and, and people in like, they like books and films and things of that. And my, my fan page is not a Facebook page. I'm listed as having a Facebook page and I, and they have me as it's my Facebook page. I never go on it. I go to the fan page and that Facebook page, there's no telling what, what's on all these ads, all these different stuff, but you have to have that page to have the fan page. And so, uh, you know, I, that, the fan page is a lot easier to handle. There's not as much stuff. You know, you got 30,000 people, but not 30,000 people write you every day, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and I also just have a built in thing that says, okay, I've spent that much time. I'm not spending any more today. And, uh, mm -hmm. I try to respond to everybody, but I can't, you know, it's, it's just too much, but, um, I'll try to answer a question that maybe several people have asked. And, uh, maybe that way I cover a, a, a more ground, but, uh, if I didn't, if, if you didn't have to do a lot of the work yourself today to promote yourself, to make sure people even know those books are out there, I probably wouldn't do either one of them. Um, although I, certainly there are people, friendships that I've made that I would miss, but outside of friendships I've made online, I'm not one of those people that always, you know, takes to heart that I've got this person on my Twitter page. And, uh, you know, I don't want to end up uh, like thinking I've got this great friend and, and it, and it's just somebody on Twitter. And I don't want them to do that either, you know. Uh, some, yeah. some people you can meet that way and have a real friendship that way. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But on the whole, I want to know people face to face. You know, I, mm -hmm. when uh, Bill Paxson I, I optioned, uh, well, the company, whoever he was working with at that time, I forget who we had at that time, but optioned uh, the bottoms. 
I already liked his work, but when I met him at a, um, a film, film festival, we hit it off and became good friends and whatever, but it made a difference not knowing just the persona that they present that you, that you see, which can be transferred to like Twitter or, or a fan page or whatever, but you meet somebody in person, you, you begin to realize who they are and you just, you know, and you know, Bill wasn't a movie star type guy. He was just this great human being. And that's what interested me. And I wanted to make, make sure. And I'd always loved his work. And, uh, you know, I saw the film he directed frailty, which was just awesome. But then it really, yeah. for me, it, it had more to do with personal contact. I mean, sometimes my agent will make deals with people I don't know. And, uh, you know, that happens. You can't do this business and expect to meet everybody all the time. But, you know, I really loved meeting him. And, and, and you know, there are good people in this business, even though there are a lot of lousy people in the film part of it. There are good people mm -hmm. like Bill was wonderful and, and Bruce Campbell and Don and, you know, and many others, J Jim Mickle and. Uh, Nick Dimici. I mean, uh, all of these people uh, have become friends, but not because we were friends on Twitter, <laughs> but because we actually had the opportunity to to meet. Yeah. So, so how do people get a hold of you or find you? Do you have a website? Uh, yeah, I have a website. Or I you have, have the fan page, and I have the Twitter page, and I apparently I have an Instagram page, but I don't use it at all. My my daughter set it up, and she uses it to help promote things of mine. She's a wonderful. Um, promoter of my work and, and helps me a lot of things as my wife has done, you know, nearly our entire life. She actually is the secret behind all of our successes because she's managed our careers. She's not an agent, but she always kept everything together. She's kind of retired from that now because as time has gone on, we've had accountants and agents and all of this other stuff that, that ends up you have to have just to, to keep going unless you want to spend, you know, have my poor wife spend, you know, 20 hours a day <laughs> working on it. They can go to joelansdale.com though, right? Is they that, really yeah. can. But I, you know, my, my favorite place for people to contact me is probably my fan page or Twitter. Page. Oh, there you go. Now we're going to have that up on the website as well. So people can find you with one click that are I'm easy to find. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. He's easy to find. Just type in his name. You'll find him. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank and, you. Uh, oh yeah. You know, good luck with everything. Keep going, and you too. And uh, I have to, what your 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 one book coming out. I have to say the one it's called the uh, what is it the uh, the Donut Legion. Right. What's that going to be about? Well, it's a it's a conspiracy novel, really. In a way, it's it's uh, I, I think it's about fanatics, people that have taken some sort of stupid idea to heart, but it's no more stupid than the real ideas people have taken to heart. And uh, I did a lot of research on that. And at first I thought, oh, this is just crazy. And then I started reading all these books and, and things where people had these, you know, very conspiratorial beliefs and, and, you know, crazy beliefs about this and that. And, and I just felt like that this was all it gotten to where it was no longer a fringe group. But just the, you know, the crazy of the week. And, uh, I just thought that this particular book would be good to express that. Uh, I didn't know it when I was writing it, but I was reading all these other things. And when I started writing this book, which I thought was just a, a crime novel, a mystery novel. And then what happens always happens, like what we referred to earlier is that things that interest me or things that are going on in my life seep into the world. <laughs> Looking well, forward to that. <laughs> yeah. You certainly got a lot, a lot to, to draw from. Lately. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Well, again, thank you very much. Our guest today has been uh, Joe Lansdale. Thanks. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.